So one thing that you might uh, find helpful in terms of helping your students plan uh, or helping yourself plan, I guess, for your students um, is that the out of class documents really lay out the relationship between content, the concepts, and the skills. Those are kind of the three big building blocks of the curriculum design, and those are really what's reflected um, in our outcome statements. An outcome is going to tell us what our students are expected to know, understand, and be able to do once they have met that outcome. And so the outcomes and the other supporting information that are found in the at a glance help us see how the content concepts and skills kind of come together in terms of what we're going to ask students to explore and the kinds of skills that we want them to develop. So we'll start with the content because obviously, you know, content is extremely important in all social studies courses and often as teachers, I think that's where our heads go first. So you can kind of think about the content as the what behind the outcome. Students need to have a solid foundation of content knowledge in order to support the development of their conceptual understanding. You'll notice that the outcomes in the renewed curriculum have been written to be very broad. So you can choose to focus on the specific content in response to your students' interests and learning needs. So really the way the course has been designed is so that you can kind of build content knowledge through exploring various case studies with your students. So this is the outcome on environmental justice issues and we can kind of take a look at this one as an example. It doesn't specify anywhere sort of in the outcome that there are sort of um, case studies that you must look at. Instead, we would really recommend that you kind of think about how you could build their knowledge around environmental justice issues, perhaps using local and national examples. So there's a wide range, unfortunately, in Nova Scotia that you could look at. Shelburne, Lincolnville, Spaganakadee First Nation, Picto, Picto Landing First Nation, Sydney, Africville are all examples of local communities that could serve as case studies and then there are many more across Canada so it really gives students that you know sort of opportunity to like think locally and then think about it in the national context as well. So we can also use the concepts that are found in the at a glance documents to think about what it is that we want students to be able to understand. So if the content is kind of the what of the outcome, the concepts help us understand the why, they're gonna help move our students from knowledge to understanding. So with this outcome, we can see that as students are exploring this concept of environmental justice as part of the outcome, there's also related concepts like how decisions around land use are made, the impacts of environmental racism on communities. And as a teacher, you can kind of use that to scaffold the concepts um, over time so that as students are working towards the outcome, they're not starting with this sort of great big broad outcome, they're starting maybe with something that's more focused and concentrated. And that's something that we can talk to our students about too, because they often will come to you when they want to, you know, do some research and they'll say, I'm really interested in World War II right? And that is way too big and way too broad. So in the same way that we're maybe kind of over the course of this semester building our conceptual knowledge so that students can, you know, work towards these big broad outcomes, that's one way that we can sort of show students the same thing that like World War II is not going to be an effective topic, you know, as a whole for a presentation. So what specifically about it is it that we want to look at and help them kind of narrow it down and bring it in. And lastly, in order to be able to get students to apply their knowledge and understanding, we also need to think about the how, and that is the skills. So the outcomes include skills that students need to develop so that they can put their knowledge and understanding in action, into action. Um, throughout the course, students should be encouraged to develop their understanding of the methods and skills found in social studies courses. So in this example, students learn how to investigate, analyze, compare, and evaluate, and that helps them deepen their knowledge and understanding of environmental justice. But those are also skills that are going to appear in other outcomes so that the students are building those 
skills across OCOMS over the course of the semester. And that's also going to really help them when they get to their own inquiry questions. So for example, if they are analyzing and evaluating source material in relation to environmental justice and, you know, thinking about what makes a source credible and reliable and how do I determine what information I want to pull from the source, that's a skill that's going to transfer and apply again and again and again over the course of the semester so that students are really having a lot of time to be able to kind of build those skills. This is going to support them as they engage with the research process and consider all of those relevant sources of information and data and then organize and communicate their own findings as well. So ultimately, our goal is that we are helping students to be able to do these things more independently. And the curriculum has really been designed to um, allow you as the teachers to kind of be able to put those uh, skills, you know, into action for the kids all, you know, across the semester so that they're able to do that. It's also worth mentioning here that the indicators that are in the at-a-glance document are also designed to support you in planning, scaffolding your inquiries. Obviously, you know, it's up to you how you want to go about setting up, you know, an inquiry within your classroom, but those are there as sort of um, indications of what like stepping stones, if we can use that, um, towards the outcome might look like. So again, in the same way that a student may not walk into your grade 10 classroom on September 7th ready to evaluate an issue, you know, through kind of building those skills of investigating and analyzing and comparing, eventually we get them there. Um, and so those are really there, you know, to support you with those planning purposes, but also to port, support students and being able to kind of do those more complex, higher level thinking skills as well. It's a good opportunity to, um, you know, once you meet your students and get to know them a little bit better to think about, you know, when will students need some more explicit instruction and time to practice in order to be able to support them with their learning. Often, you know, we may have grade 10 students that are, you know, coming in from several different schools and their experiences are different within the classroom. And so that may mean for them, for example, that you have some kids that are really, you know, really versed in citations. They have that stuff down flat and other students where maybe they are seeing those kinds of things for the first time. And so it gives you a little bit of an opportunity with fewer outcomes to think about where you might want to slow down and really sort of explicitly teach those kinds of skills to your students. And to support you with that, it is worth mentioning that that outcome uh, related to research strategies was purposefully built into the course and designed to so that you could return to it at various times throughout the semester. So for those of you who do teach, um, like, let's say, IB history year one and year two, for example, and you're doing the historical investigation, I know that many of your schools sort of build that in as an ongoing assessment piece that's happening over the course of a semester or over the course of an entire year depending on your scheduling and so this research outcome has been designed in the same way where rather than it just being kind of an add-on at the end of the course it really does sort of connect to how students are learning throughout the semester so you can have students you know maybe at the beginning of October starting to develop their own historical inquiry and they're working on it and developing it over the course of the semester um, in order to make sure that you know they really are preparing themselves for what they're going to need to be able to do in grade 11 and 12. The ultimate goal for this outcome is that students are going to design their own inquiry and communicate their findings supported by evidence, uh, which is why the other outcomes have been designed to support them in building those skills. Over the course of the semester, when the students are practicing developing inquiry questions, organizing information, choosing their primary and secondary sources, all of that good stuff that we do in social studies classroom, it really does help them when they get to sort of doing something like this with more independence. Um, so for example, if your students were looking at, you know, evaluating responses to environmental justice issues with you during the semester, and that was something that really interested them, they might want to choose an aspect of that as being being sort of the genesis of their own uh, independent research process, and that is totally fine. There are going to be other students where, you know, the case studies that you look at over the course of the year may not get to a particular passion of theirs, and so it is okay for them as well to choose a topic that hasn't already been covered in the course. And again, you as the teachers will have the flexibility to kind of determine what works best there for your students. 
So for the rest of our session today, we're going to continue looking at this outcome in particular. We're going to chat a bit about how we might plan to engage students in using an inquiry based approach and loop in some of the concepts included in the research process outcomes, such as developing questions and using various sources to support an inquiry. Often in grade 10, our students aren't really used to posing research questions of their own. They have lots of curiosity. They wonder a lot of things, but when it comes to sort of taking those big curiosities and wonderings and narrowing them down into a, um, you know, we used to kind of call it a just right question in our classroom. So it's not too big and it's not too small. It kind of allows us to answer it um, in, you know, in an appropriate way. And that's a skill for students to learn in and of, you know, itself. And so we really want to kind of help them with being able to sort of start practicing asking those questions. Um, we know in social studies that really everything starts with a question and so the at a glance document also includes guiding questions that might be helpful starting places as you begin inquiry based learning with your students and as the students become more familiar with IBL they can start to co-create some questions with you or they can develop their own questions. Just as a side note, each of the learning experiences found in our shared drive begins with an inquiry question from the at a glance documents. Today we might take a few minutes to explore some of the different ways that you can use sources as prompts to help your students begin to generate questions and maybe what I will do now is throw it over to Joni. Thank you, Amy. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, I'm going to pick it up where you left off about engaging our students with beginning the inquiry, inquiry prompts. So I'm going to ask Brian to advance uh, to the next slide. And I'm going to give you just a minute to take a peek at that map in front of you. So here is one example of a source you might use to get your students asking questions in related to in relation, excuse me, to the outcome, learners will evaluate Canadian responses to environmental justice issues. We chose a map here as a prompt or a spark because it's easy to project and navigate with students as they begin their inquiry. A French version is going to follow on the next slide for those who are going to be teaching um, in French immersion next year. In this map, looking at the legend, we see that toxic industries, waste disposal sites, and thermal generating stations are indicated by the red dots. And the light gray circles represent a 10 kilometer radius from the site. African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq communities are indicated by the gold dots you see. There are many strategies you could use to get students started with generating questions about what they are observing. Let's talk about a couple of examples here. If students haven't had a lot of experience with posing questions, which may be the case for some of our grade 10s, one strategy you might try to is one strategy you may try, tongue twister, is that they could start with a partner or a small group before choosing a couple of questions to share with the larger class. So they would get together in a small group, generate some questions, and pick some that they wish to share with the greater group. At this stage, students might ask a lot of closed questions questions that have one answer perhaps. Some questions might be, what are the names of those communities? Um, what are the thermal generating stations? What are those thermal generating stations called? Or who made the decision about where those industries went? So Brian, if we could advance to the next slide. Here is another example of a strategy we could use for students who may need some additional support in asking questions. It's the observe, think, and question protocol. So in this kind of questioning strategy, we first ask students to record their observations about the prompt. In this case, again, we're using the map. In the observe section, students are recording the facts, just the facts. What am I seeing on this map? Next, we can ask students to jot down what they know about the concept of environmental justice. 
And for some of our students, if this is brand new, we might want to ask them to do a little preliminary research at this stage. Thinking is also an opportunity for students to make some inferences based on what they have observed in the observation section. Further and lastly, we'll ask students to synthesize their observations and knowledge to generate new questions. What do you wonder about? This will encourage them to ask more open-ended questions like, what role does racism play in determining where toxic industries are located in our province? And perhaps how have communities been affected by environmental injustices in Nova Scotia? And how are communities working to create environmental justice in some of these communities? So once students have had the opportunity to develop more open-ended questions, they can begin to devise research pathways as they identify sources of information and gather evidence to support their answers. So hopefully that gave you some strategies or some ideas, which I'm sure many of you use already, and it might spark some more thought today. Um, at this point, we're going to spend a few minutes in breakout session. And because our number is small, Amy, I think we will keep the group. Is it one group of four today? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And so we're going to give you a chance to talk with each other about prompts, such as we used with the map, protocols, such as you saw just in the last slide, or strategies you use to get your students involved in asking questions in relation to what they're learning, the outcomes. So in your small groups today, we'll invite you to consider with will invite you to consider other prompts you might use to spark inquiry or promote inquiry in your classroom. Or maybe you're going to talk about other things you've tried with students to get them asking questions. So we're going to give you about five minutes in your breakout session. And are there any questions about what your task is in the breakout room? No questions, so we're going to give you about five minutes together and then Amy will bring you back. And if one person wouldn't mind sharing what you have discussed, or if one person's not feeling comfortable, perhaps two people could do so. And you'll get a couple of minutes to share what you discussed. Okay, I see everyone is back. Is there one person who would like to speak for about one minute on some of the items you discussed regarding prompts and strategies to involve students in getting started on their questions for inquiry? I was voluntold. Um, Thank you, so, Chris. Um, five minutes is never enough time, but uh, Sandra brought up a really good point about <clears throat> and, and working off of what Christine said, Christina said that, um, you know, it's bringing students from the broad to the, to the focused. And that's a really hard task, especially at the grade 10 level, uh, because they've only been, I shouldn't say they've only, um, the experience that I've had and I'm only using my experience is that when students come to me, they, they work in the broad, um, they're used to working in a Wikipedia kind of mentality. Um, which causes problems when you're saying, okay, now you've got to get all of this into 1,000 words. And when they hear 1,000 words at the beginning of the semester, they're uh, kind of overwhelmed. And by the end, they're like, I need more. And <laughs> so it's, you know, when you build that concept, so and the, I guess the biggest thing that we, we were trying to figure out, because Thea brought up that, you know, Case studies are going to be easy. We can find the case studies. It's the skills. How do we teach these skills? <clears throat> and, and from my perspective, building on what Christina said, um, and um, you know, building on what Sandra brought up, it all starts at the beginning when you connect with the students. It's that the first week is is the hook. You have to. We as teachers have to hook them. 
to love history so that by the end of the course, they're like, I don't want to go. I don't want to leave. Um, and ultimately, we are responsible for them to appreciate history <clears throat> and moving you know, ancient history is easy. They love mummies. And that's the connection right there. Um, this is going to be a little bit more challenging in my perspective, from my perspective, because Students are going to come to us with, oh, uh, we've done history, we've done Canadian history. It's so boring. And so I know my job is to make Canadian history like as exciting as mummies. So Sandra, or sorry, Thea, when you're when you're kind of that first week, you've got to make Canadian history exciting for them because then they will want to pursue um, the, these observations, these thinking. Uh, experiences and then question. So, you know, I think that's I think that's a summary of what's in my head and what I've heard in our five minutes. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. You were able to weave in. I see many voices from your conversation, and thank you for reminding us about that hook at the very beginning of the year and to get students to love history and. And uh, I will now turn the presentation back over to Amy to continue with learning experiences. Yes, thank you. And you're right, you know, five minutes is never enough time. And we really hope that we're able to bring folks together. I always say like, you know, pandemic willing, um, you know, in during the school year this year so that we can have more opportunities for conversations because I think a lot of the things that you folks talked about even in that five minutes are shared experiences you know for history teachers across the province you know how do we really get the kids engaged and then use that engagement as a way to kind of drive them forward in terms of building their skills and you know taking it from you know the broad to the narrow and learning how to you know bring it all together um, so we are going to quickly talk uh, just about the learning experience experience is something that might be helpful for you in terms of knowing a little bit about how they're designed uh, in order to be able to maybe consider some ways you might use them, you know, either at the very beginning of the semester or over the course of the semester. Um, with students because that was one thing that some folks had indicated that they'd like a little bit more information on. So in your shared drive, you're going to find four learning experiences in the supporting document. And these were written to promote inquiry-based learning in relation to contemporary Canadian studies. So each of the learning experiences focuses on an outcome and a specific indicator within that outcome, and then uses one of the guiding questions from the curriculum as sort of the launching point for the inquiry. It's important to note that the guiding questions there are just meant to serve as examples. So for you and your class could choose to create other questions that would be you know maybe in line with your students interests and needs so for example the question that we chose focuses on the physical and mental health of communities but we know that all dimensions of health including emotional social and spiritual health are impacted by environmental racism and we also know that community members and their descendants can be impacted for generations and in different ways so when you're engaging with inquiry-based learning with your students one of the nice things about it is it is flexible you can choose to use a guiding question from the curriculum if that works but you could also co-create other questions or encourage you know students trying their hand at starting to develop some questions as well um, to help sort of guide the learning as you're going through and Brian maybe I'll get you to hop to the next one thank you so each learning experience is also divided into three parts to support students in engaging with the research process and communicating their learning in response to an inquiry question. The learning experiences, kind of like the outcomes, are written in such a way that as you're choosing your case studies, you can kind of choose the contexts that are going to be most relevant to your students and kind of apply them using that learning experience as a bit of a framework. Um, each learning experience also ends with an opportunity for students to communicate their learning. We know in grade 10 that there are going to be lots of students who have come to you and they may have had little or no experience with doing things like writing thesis statements or structuring their arguments. So you can experiment with different ways that students can try responding to inquiry questions. I know that some of you do things like have them present an argument maybe orally first or as part of a debate style piece before going on to do any kind of written arguments. 
And so this, again, is written in a way that's meant to be very flexible. So you can kind of choose what's going to work for your students at that point in the semester um, and really help them be able to kind of communicate their learning effectively. Um, all of the examples give the students the opportunity to develop some inquiry questions, explore sources and perspectives, and structure their responses. And so this is kind of, um, you know, a framework that you can use if you so choose with your students over and over again throughout the semester. The other thing that it is worth uh, drawing your attention to, Brian, if I could just get you to hop to the next one, is that each learning experience uh, contains additional resources that relate specifically to that lesson. So in the example we reviewed today, there's information um, obviously on environmental justice issues in Nova Scotia and Canada, but there's also one uh, for this one specifically about how to create a story map through ArcGIS as just an example of a way that students students can share their findings. So if you've never accessed it before, ArcGIS is an icon that you can access on your GNS PES landing page. And then the students can access an online tutorial on how to make story maps about the communities that they're researching. We also included in this additional resources section and an example of a story map about Africville. Um, so that might, you know, be a helpful exemplar for students to think about how they could be combining research from various sources and different kinds of sources, you know, textual information, photographs, maps, those kinds of things in order to be able to communicate what they've learned. So, you know, again, just worth thinking about if you're if you're kind of thinking about where you might want to get started with students, the learning experience that goes along with this outcome provides you with that kind of information. So uh, we are almost at the end of our time here, I see, and we do hope that this session has been helpful in giving you some ideas and resources that can help you get started with contemporary Canadian studies. The inquiry-based design of the course should hopefully help to support your students in engaging with the research process over the semester. We also hope that the contemporary sort of focus of the course will help, you know, students start to make those connections like people noted at the beginning between sort of themselves and the world around them and the history that they're learning about and digging into why you know these these things still matter in Canadian society um, and then we also hope that the additional resources found at the learning experiences can be starting places for your students um, I did check in with the book bureau just as sort of a side note and they were at that point in time anticipating that if your schools didn't already have the text-based resources that they would be arriving very shortly if I get an actual ETA I'll just send out a note for folks to let you know when they arrive because sometimes they know they show up in a box in the office and over the summer can end up going into the wrong teacher's classroom or whatever so I will let you know when when they've arrived um, so we only have a couple of minutes left but if there are any questions or if there's anything that you know you think like if we do have the opportunity to get together in the fall I'd really like us to talk about you know xyz um, please feel free to to chime in and let us know Amy, I have a quick question. Um, so we are going to have a very mixed bag of, of students signing up for this course, if not this year, um, in the coming years. Um, as you said, some of them um, wanting like a pre-IB experience, some of them will probably take it just to get the Canadian Studies credit over with in grade 10. Um, in Canadian studies, Mi'kmaq studies and African Canadian studies, they have to do um, kind of a, a bringing together um, assignment at the end. Um, it, it's called an independent study. And so in this course, they're kind of doing independent studies throughout. Is that what I'm taking from this? Um, because... Um, I see as a potential problem and not to be the negative Nancy, uh, the problem is, is that um, we will have a whole variety of kids who will want to take this course for one of those reasons and um, they won't necessarily be able to for, for reasons of ability, for reasons of interest 
be able to carry out the rigor of the contemporary Canadian studies. Um, can you just comment on that perhaps about um, what we're going to do if we get a very, very weak student? Sure. So in the context of your courses, obviously, you're always going to, you know, be working with your curriculum and adapting it to individual students learning needs. So for example, if you end up with students in your class that have, you know, adaptations in TINET, um, you know, so perhaps I'll just think of an example off the top of my head. So perhaps, for example, there's an adaptation in TINET where for whatever reason, a written response to an independent project is, you know, sort of beyond what they can do. Like you have the flexibility as the teacher to be able to adapt those things for them. I know that for a lot of, you know, seasoned pre-IB folks, we like to get them into, okay, knowing that a lot of our kids are going on and doing writing, you know, as part of their IB history, their IB English, you know, whatever the case may be. And so grade 10 is an important important opportunity for them to practice that, they would still, you know, we still need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, this is a PSP course, not an IB course. It is going to be potentially in your school is not the only one um, that does not have sort of a, a cohort of kids that have only identified as sort of pre-IB students. And so there's going to be a really diverse range of learning needs. And so what I would say is, you know, adapt it in the ways that are going to work best for your students. For those students who are going on to consider, you know, going into IB, we do want them to be thinking about the kinds of things that they're going to need that are going to support them best when they get into grade 11. But if we also have students who are there, like, as you said, because they need a Canadian studies credit, and they may have learning needs that make it, you know, so that it's not possible for them to, you know, write a, a mini research paper or whatever the case may be, you can still adapt that along the way. And in some of those cases, that those might be the perfect students to encourage that if they're doing research to choose something that you've kind of modeled for them over the course of the year in terms of the topics and the structures and they can go back to that as well. There's no expectation with those uh, independent research components in any of our social studies courses that it has to be like a written research essay for example. Um, you know there's not a specified number of sources that students need to look at so you do have flexibility there as a teacher to sort of make some adjustments so that they're going to meet the needs of your individual students. Um, and I know that's always easier said than done when you have, you know, some students that are maybe headed into year one next year and you have other students, you know, who, you know, just need it because it counts as a credit towards graduation. But the idea that, you know, by the end of the course, each of the students should have engaged in an independent research project, uh, like, Yes, that is why the outcome is there, but what that independent research project looks like can be adapted to meet the learning needs of your students. Does that answer the question, Sandra? Yes, thank you very much. Before we let you go for today, is there any other questions? I see that we're three minutes over time and Chris, your garden's probably calling to you, but I just want to make sure we have a chance before we, we sign off here. All right, folks. Well, we would like to thank you for your time today. Um, we will hopefully be able to, you know, come together again as a group later on in the school year. However, if you have any questions or concerns between, you know, now and the beginning of September, anything that maybe you thought of, you know, after today's session, which sometimes does happen, please feel free to uh, email uh, Mary or, or Joni or myself and, and we'll do our darndest to, to help you. Thanks very much, everybody, for your time.